Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to Zen Pichal course entitled Twentieth Century Fiction. Well, we begin with a new text today. We just finished looking at Virginia Woolf's uh, Solid Objects, which is a short story. We'll begin with a new short story today, which will also be the penultimate text, the second last text for this course, after which we'll move on to the final text. Uh, now this particular story is called Toba Teik Seng uh, by Sadat Hassan Manter. Now uh, the original story is of course in Urdu, uh, which is a language that Manter uh, wrote in and is primarily based on what is now Pakistan. Uh, so a lot of his fiction, a lot of his writings, they deal with partition, they deal with the trauma and the violence of partition. Uh, there are more graphic stories as well, but I chose this particular story because I think it resonates very well with the, uh, the theme of this particular course, which is about consciousness, memory, and also how do you talk about, how do you represent um, human interiority, uh, the human thinking mind. Uh, that's been one of the common uh, connecting points across the text, if you remember. So whether it's Ulysses by James Joyce, uh, whether it's Catherine Mansfield's The Fly, whether it's uh, To Go the Postmaster, this entire uh, examination of interiority, the entire examination of imagination, of memory, uh, and how all these things, they define and inform what we call identity, is something which modernism or 20th century fiction uh, deals with uh, quite extensively. So this story is very political, of course, it's a story about partition, but at the same time, it's quite existential as well, very existential and very emotional. And in a way, it looks at the emotional quality, uh, qualities which inform the, the politics uh, of identity formation, the politics of uh, division, the pol politics of violence, the pol politics of classification. So um, if you take a look at the setting of the story, this is set in Lahore, uh, and Lahore of course is in Pakistan now, and it suddenly became uh, a Pakistani city after 1947, uh, prior to which there was just one big landmark, so people just existed together. Uh, there was no question of division. But with the partition, which is obviously a very violent event, as all of us know and are aware of, uh, with the partition, Lahore became uh, a different, a part of a different country, uh, in Pakistan, whereas in other parts of um, the Myanmar came to India, like Amritsar, for instance. Now, the quality, the key, the unique thing about Lahore is uh, what everyone expected at that point of time, everyone expected Lahore to come to India and not go to Pakistan, because, you know, that was the cherry on the cake, in a way. And uh, the Indian leaders wanted it, the Pakistani leaders wanted it. So it was a bit of a contested category in terms of which way it will go, uh, which, which, which country, which modern state will, will have Lahore. It was a very cosmopolitan state, it was a very, very cosmopolitan city, sorry. Uh, extremely vibrant, extremely cultural, and very, very multicultural and, and you know, uh, you know, very progressive in many ways. Right, so Lahore was obviously a very uh, key uh, thing, a very key space. Uh, so when Lahore went to Pakistan, it was uh, contrary to, to much of popular expectations. And at that point in time, Indian leaders, uh, Indian sentiment, they wanted Lahore quite extensively. So the fact that this is set in Lahore is interesting because uh, given that what I just told you, it, is also, it should also be obvious that for a long time, uh, people in Lahore did not feel the need uh, to come to India because they thought they'll go to India anyway. So Lahore became one of the most violent places in partition because you know it's a very very delayed kind of movement which happened in Lahore because for a long time people in Lahore they thought they would go to India and when it turned out that you know it's, it's decided they would go to Pakistan it would have been too late by then to shift and migrate and in the process many of them got um, you know were subjected uh, to violence and trauma. Now the other important thing about the story is it's a certain asylum a madhouse in Lahore and that immediately becomes a very political space. It becomes, in a way, a biopolitical space because you know, the madhouse, in a way, traditionally, uh, classically, if you read Foucault, the history of madness, uh, etc., uh, or the archaeology of knowledge uh, or madness of civilization, we find that a madhouse always becomes a space of you know, a lot of discursive apparatus, uh, medicine being one of them, uh, control and coercion being one of them. And we've already seen a little bit of this in Mrs. Dalloway, for instance, if you remember, uh, the entire idea of Septimus Smith being uh, you know, a malingerer, uh, being someone who's just failing to have a disease, uh, some mental illness which is not really a disease, 
Now that perspective, the very hardcore materialist medical perspective was taken by the uh, then neurologists at the time, which in a way, which contributed to Septimus's trauma and demise and sensory alienation and eventual demise. You know, something similar happens here as well. It's a madhouse that we find that the madhouse suddenly becomes a very discursive space because, you know, the mad people uh, are not really the normative citizens. So they are the ones who have been away from the mainstream movements. Uh, so some of them are not even aware of partition. It's like a Rip Van Winkle situation uh, where just suddenly they wake up and a civil war has happened and the country is divided. So something similar happens here as well where uh, the madmen just suddenly are told that, you know, there's a partition, that a divide was taking place and now there be some rational classifications, rational reclassifications. Now, what it immediately brings to the fore is the entire absurdity of bureaucracy, the entire absurdity of political rationality and political rationale, and how the madhouse or the mad men in the madhouse, ironically or paradoxically, they turn out to be uh, they turn out to be asking more fundamental questions, which are more rational, more sane, and more definitely more human in quality. Right. So the the entire idea of rationality and irrationality, the entire dichotomy of the binary, sort of turn on its head, if you will. Right. So, uh, the madhouse becomes a discursive space, the madhouse becomes a space of some kind of a resistance uh, because the madmen, they refuse to go to India or Pakistan and you find that because they, they're not really in the loop or not really switched on about the political movements and the political changes, most of them couldn't care less about India or Pakistan. They just want to go back to their homes in some village, in some city, in some town, which doesn't exist. Now, Toba Teik Singh is the name of one such village. And interestingly, what you find in the story is this village just disappears from the map, which brings us to the other point which is interesting for the story, the entire politics of producing maps. Uh, map making, as you all know, is a very political um, activity. So when you make a map, you're including certain territories, but equally, you're excluding certain territories. So map making has a liminal uh, inclusion-exclusion quality about it already. The idea of you know, map making is very is akin structurally as well as sentimentally to the idea of representation. Now, when you represent something, there are certain bits which get accentuated, there are certain bits which get highlighted, there are certain bits which get included, but equally, there are certain other bits which get erased or unaccentuated or non highlighted or just you know, they disappear from the uh, order of representation. So, likewise, map making, when you draw a map, you're including certain territories, but equally, you're excluding certain other territories. Now, Toba takes saying, that village uh, where the character Bishan Singh comes from, uh, the protagonist Bishan Singh comes from, is one such territory. It becomes a no space, it becomes a no man's land. And I will come back to the idea of no man's land later, it is a very symbolic space which will appear again in the story. So, Toba takes in what literally becomes a no man's land, it is a no land, a no place which interestingly or paradoxically makes it utopian in quality because the entire idea of utopia if you take a look at the word uh, etymologically utopia you with nowhere and topos is land or topography or landmass so it's utopia is literally speaking it means no land in other words no land is perfect but is that perfect land in your mind which doesn't really exist in the map so there is a utopian quality about Toba takes saying that village which is nowhere to be found but also uh, Toba takes him becomes a very real reminder of how uh, these spatial classifications are done in such an absurd manner uh, to the extent that you know, certain spaces get erased completely from human ima imagination. Uh, they get erased completely from the map making imagination where you make a map but you do not include certain things, certain spaces. So, those are effectively erased away, right. So, Toba takes things also with erasure, an erasure of space which in a way contributes towards an erasure of identity. And the madman's attempt to claim their space back, the madman's attempt to reclaim it, to reassert it, uh, and to actually demand for that space becomes very ironically the only sane subversive model available, or the only sane model of subversion available uh, at this point of time. So, sanity and subversion, insanity and uh, confirmation, they all become very complex categories in the story, right. So, uh, uh, you know, we find that this is, like I mentioned, this is a story which happens right after the partition in 1947, maybe two or three years later, where the story begins uh, with bureaucratic decisions among the top officials in each country, where suddenly they realize there are some Hindus who are left behind in Pakistan and there are some Muslims who wanted to come back to Pakistan perhaps, so, you know, they should also be allowed to do it. So, there will be like an exchange of madmen across the borders, uh, which 
the very spectacle of which it highlights or accentuates or foregrounds the absurdity. But the, the real absurdity is obviously the key question about partition in the first place. So the obvious question that comes up in the story is the very act of partition, the very activity, the very decision of partition, the very exercise of partition, that itself uh, is a very, very absurd uh, activity. Uh, so the whole idea of absurdity and rationality are very, you're almost going to invert it in some sense because like you mentioned, the madman's response uh, to the entire idea of two countries, uh, that turns out to be probably the most sane response, the most commonsensical, the most rational response, where they know where they tell each other we don't really go, want to go to India or Pakistan. We couldn't care less about the two nation states. What about our homes? What about the village that we grew up in? So, you know, that is the uh, aspiration. To, that's a nostalgia. There's no nostalgia. There's no national nostalgia. Now, what that also tells us is that the whole idea of nation as a political construct is essentially a Western import. Uh, it's imported from the Western uh, in a political system, the whole idea of the nation state. Because prior to this, there was no such nation state in India. I mean, India was obviously different kingdoms, different villages, different towns, uh, different uh, dynasties. But the whole idea of nation as one country coming together uh, with a constitution, with a, with a standard legal system, is a post colonial phenomenon, is a post imperial phenomenon. Right? So, uh, Toba takes saying, in a way, this story may be read as a refusal to subscribe to the idea of the nation state, as a refusal to subscribe to the idea of a national citizenship. Uh, and obviously, we are now. Uh, even in, in a country today, there's a lot of complex questions about citizenship that we have to uh, have a very nuanced understanding. Uh, but this story too, uh, and the reason why it resonates with us even today, is because it's, it talks about some very fundamental human emotion. One um, obvious emotion is alienation. The fact that you're emotionally alienated because of a cultural or political decision, which takes place somewhere else, where you have no access to, where you have no agency. Uh, towards and this whole idea of agency lessness becomes important as well because you know decisions are made for you decisions are made about you uh, and are never with you right so the whole idea of staying away or you know forcing uh, forcibly staying away or someone's actually asking you to stay away are not really uh, participating in the decision making process while at the same time being subjected to the outcomes of those decisions makes the story uh, really a story about human helplessness or human agency lessness at a time of political crisis at a time of political uh, totalitarianism, right? So this is the, the setting in the story. And of course, as you move on, we find out some of the more nuances, especially the way the story ends. It's very, very interesting. This may be familiar to uh, many of you. You may have read this, uh, you know, in different times or different situations. But what I want to do in this case, and the reason why I've chosen this text is because I want to make it connect with some of the other modernist texts we have done so far, with the question of agency, memory, nostalgia and affect or affective identities become very, very important. Right? Identities which rely on effect, identities which are produced by effect. The effect could one be one of nostalgia, the effect could be one of mourning, the effect could one be about happiness. But in either way, the, the, the affective production of identities is something that Toba Teg Singh really excels in as a short story. Right, so with that preamble uh, you know, in mind, let's begin the story, let's dive right into the text. So this is Toba Teg Singh by Sadat Hassan Manter, which should be on your screen. Okay, so here we begin. Two or three years after the 1947 partition, it occurred to the governments of India and Pakistan to exchange the lunatics in the same manner as it exchanged the criminals. So again, look at the, um, and the conjoining of criminals and lunatics. So the, the interesting thing is these are not really alleged citizens. So, you know, criminals are dissenters, lunatics are madmen. So none of these two categories are subscribe to the normative category of citizenship, right? So they don't really belong to that normative map as such. Uh, so it was decided that the madmen and the criminals were put together and exchanged, uh, you know, as per the rationale, the religious rationale, which caused the partition. So we find that entire, this entire statement, the, the very opening, which appears to be very, very objective, which appears to be very detached, and actually, it's actually packed with irony, it's packed with sarcasm, it's packed with um, a very biting, uh, satirical uh, intent. Uh, the Muslim lunatics in India were to be sent over to Pakistan, and the Hindu and Sikh lunatics in Pakistani asylums were to be handed over to India. So the Hindu and the Sikh lunatics in Pakistan would be coming to India, and the Muslim lunatics in Pakistan, if they want to, they'll go back to India, to, to Pakistan. But right, so again, this religious, very reductionist religious uh, rationale, which is used to describe this uh, decision uh, of a crossover according to your religious uh, affiliations and religious affinities. It was difficult to say whether the proposal made any sense or not. However, the decision had been taken at the topmost level on both sides. 
after high level conferences were, were held a day, uh, after high level conferences were held a day was fixed for exchange of the lunatics. It was agreed that those Muslim lunatics uh, who had families in India would be permitted to stay back while the rest would be escorted to the borders. Since almost all the Hindu and Muslims have migrated to, from Pakistan, the question of retaining non-Muslim lunatics in Pakistan did not arise. All of them were to be taken to India. So again, look at the impassionate, almost detached tone of the journalistic tone of this narrator over here. Now, the other thing we find about the story is this Kafkaesque quality, this, this bizarre, irrational quality, which is very Kafkaesque. Now, we are told that there is some decision-making body on either side of the government uh, who had some closed-door meetings, some closed-door conferences, some closed-door decisions, which had obviously nothing to do with the uh, agency and the will of the people. No one really asks these madmen what they wanted. Uh, that was obviously uh, out of question. No consensus was taken, no voting was done. So, uh, this is the irony, the fact that these are two democratic nations, but the way they treat their dissenting citizens like madmen and criminals, the decisions are taken just for them, about them, without any consultation whatsoever. So it was many many conferences were held, uh, many top level meetings were you know held and organized bureaucratically, and then was decided uh, to swap it according to some rationale. So the Muslim lunatics in India who had families in Pakistan would be shipped back to Pakistan, uh, whereas in the Hindus and the Sikh lunatics in Pakistan would be sent back to India. So that was a decision taken after a lot of top level closed door conferences, and the top level closed door quality is obviously meant to be something like an ivory tower from which the common people to which the common people has no access whatsoever. So people have no access to the ivory tower. At the same time, their lives are getting affected uh, by the decisions taken in some closed uh, conferences. So again, this complete break from the people and the political uh, will or the political party or the political uh, muscle, this complete rupture, this complete departure from these two categories makes it a very, very dystopian kind of a setting. The fact that the people have absolutely no access or no will or no agency in terms of determining what they want, right? So, what is good for them? Okay, so nobody knew what transpired in India, but so far as Pakistan was concerned, this news created quite a stir in the lunatic asylum at Lahore, leading to all sorts of funny developments. A Muslim lunatic, a regular leader of the fairy Urdu daily Zamindar, when asked where Pakistan was, reflected for a while and, and replied, Don't you know? A place in India uh, known for manufacturing cut throat razors. Apparently satisfied, the friend asks no more questions. So again, these irrational, bizarre questions, which are supposed to, which are superficially funny, and quality, they actually have a dark uh, quality as well, a darker, deeper quality. Because you know, this question about where is Pakistan and the response is a place where racism are made, while being completely irrational, it also highlights the irrationality and absurdity of the partition itself in the first place. You know, the whole point is where is Pakistan? Where is the need to divide two countries, which had you know historically been you know divide one big landmass and one big community of people who have historically lived together for so many centuries. So that, that question obviously is not asked over here. Whereas what gets asked are those trivial questions, those seemingly meaningless questions, which in a way throw light on the question which is not asked. So again, we find how absences play a very key role here as well. Uh, something we see, we keep seeing in modernism, that absences play a very key role. What is not said, what is not asked, sometimes become way more important than what actually eventually gets asked. Okay, likewise, a Sikh lunatic asks another Sikh, Sadaji, why are we being departed to India? We don't even know the language. The Sikh gave a knowing smile, but I know the language of Hindu Saras. He replied, those bloody Indians, the way they strut about. So again, look at the way in which someone who's a Sikh, who's notionally supposed to be an Indian, is being very, very critical of Indians, is very, very, you know, passing all these disparaging remarks about India in the first place. And also, this non-knowledge about the language becomes important. So the conversation, it, it sort of hovers around the idea of language. What, what are we going to do in India? We don't even know the language. Well, the response is, oh, I know Hindustani. And then, uh, and, the and then there's this offensive, you know, very critical and sarcastic command about knowing how Indians strut about, this bloody Indians, how they strut about. So this would appear racist and imperial discourse, but then this is said by notionally an Indian, or suppose someone who's supposed to be an Indian, or someone who's about to be an Indian, a sick, a sick madman. One day while taking a bath, his bath, a Muslim lunatic yelled, Pakistan and Zindabad were such fierce and that it slipped, fell down on the floor and was not unconscious. Again, this dark comic quality, the dark comic images are important in the story. Uh, there's someone, a, a madman, a Muslim madman, who just yelled and screamed, long live Pakistan, Zindabad is long live. 
long lived Pakistan to a certain extent it got so pumped up, so enthusiastic, that slipped on the flow and was knocked unconscious. So again, it's almost like a tipping point of energy. You, you just get consumed by the propaganda and you consume the propaganda to the extent that it becomes too hot to handle, it becomes too vibrant to handle, it becomes too complex to handle. And then something like that happens, you, there's a, almost a cathartic release where you say long live Pakistan because you bought that idea of Pakistan to the extent that it makes you unconscious and you fall down on the flow. Now comes the interesting bit where you look at the demography inside the madhouse. We get to know that not all these people are actually mad. There are some pretending to be mad because they are otherwise criminals and of, of course if you can medicalize the crime then you know the statement becomes or the, the punishment becomes less severe because then you have a logical medical reason to behave in a way that you did and this is what we get to know from here. Not all the lunatics were insane, quite a few of them were murderers. To escape the gallows, the relatives had gotten them in by bribing the officials. So, you know, because they have been murderers and they would normally be hanged to death, but the relatives have somehow put them inside the madman by getting presumably fake medical certificates and, and delivering those to the officials. Now, they had only a vague idea about the division of India or what Pakistan was. They were utterly ignorant of the present situation. Newspapers hardly ever gave the true picture and the asylum watchers were illiterates from whose conversation they could get not gain anything or glean anything. So again, look at the cut off quality of this asylum. It's, it's in Lahore, which is obviously a very cosmopolitan, multicultural, connected city. But the fact that it's a discursive space, the madhouse is a discursive space, also makes it insular to information. And the insularity of information is important. They don't have any knowledge at all. They sometimes read newspapers which come to them periodically, but even that gives a very unclear knowledge. So, and they want to engage with the guards, uh, these madmen inside, or the criminals who pretend to be madmen. So they want to exchange with the guards, but their guards wouldn't know much either. So this imply, uh, among other things over here, what is also the alienation is always also, also uh, uh, epistemic alienation in the sense that this is entirely about the non-availability of any knowledge or any palpable knowledge or any concrete knowledge, right? So they could glean nothing. All that these inmates knew was that there was a man named uh, Qaidi Yazm who had set up uh, a separate state from Muslims called Pakistan. But they had no idea where Pakistan was. Uh, that was why uh, they were uh, all at a loss whether they were now in India or in Pakistan. If they were in India, then where was Pakistan? If they were in Pakistan, then how come that only a short while ago they were in India? How could they be in India a short while ago and now suddenly in Pakistan? Now, this, all these questions again which appear absurd, but what they actually suggest is the porous quality about borders. You know, the fact that you can be in India in the morning, at the same time you can be in Pakistan in the evening, well, all it takes is one bureaucratic decision. All it takes is a renaming of certain names or certain places. So, among other things, Toba takes thing is also about the plasticity of identity formation, the plasticity of nationalist identity formation, right? So these questions, if this is India, uh, then, you know, how come, uh, you know, uh, suddenly this is Pakistan and this is Pakistan, how come this is India? So, you know, all these, again, seemingly absurd questions are actually very, very rational questions. So the madmen are actually asking everyone, well, if you say this is Pakistan, then how come this is India in the first place? And if you say it is India, then how come everyone wants, everyone says this is in Pakistan? Right, so, and more importantly, where is Pakistan? They have no idea where Pakistan is. Uh, obviously, it's a newer country, it's a newer phenomenon, it's a newer construct, uh, but then they have no knowledge about the constructed quality of Pakistan or the event through which Pakistan had been constructed. Okay, one of the lunatics got so bewildered uh, with his India Pakistan, Pakistan India rigmarole that one day while sweeping the flow, he climbed up the tree and sitting on the branch, harangued the people below for two hours on end about the uh, delicate problems of India and Pakistan. So again, look at the different acts of insanity over here, which again in a way becomes, uh, throws a very complex light on the rational sane decisions about nation making and nation divisions. So this, this person, one of the Renatis, said climb up a tree and started, uh, you know, talking to people, harassing people who were passing by the tree for the next uh, two hours endlessly. When the guards asked him to come down, he climbed up still higher and said, I don't want to live in India and Pakistan. I'm going to make my home right here on the stream. So again, look at the seeming absurdity in the sentence. You know, I don't want to go to India, I don't want to go to Pakistan, I want to live in the stream forever. Obviously, this is irrational, absurd, a madman's rant. But at the same time, it has some very key features which are interesting for the story. Now, what if a person doesn't want to go to India, doesn't want to go to Pakistan, but just wants to go back to his village where he grew up? Is that option available to him? Perhaps not. So we have these two different narratives which are being formed. So it's almost like two national narratives which are being formed. Or if you just push it further into a metafictional thing, uh, two plots are being written. 
two plots are being constructed. Now, would you be uh, would you rather be a character in plot A or would you rather be a character in plot B? So, two new narratives are being formed. It's a very you know this is obviously a formative phase of the two narratives. Uh, so, now they want all the classifications to take place uh, in a safe way. Uh, so, the madman and the Muslim madman should go to India, uh, Pakistan and the Hindu madman should, should come to India, right. So, all these classifications become uh, more and more cut and dried. Uh, now, obviously, uh, the people over here, um, they, they could not care less about Pakistan or India, they just want to go back to their own village and you know, their own identity is from that particular village. So, we find how these constructs are so new in quality, so recent in quality, they construct of India and they construct of Pakistan over here. The oldest hubbub affected a radio engineer with an MSc degree, a Muslim, a quiet man who took long walks by himself. One day, he stripped off all his clothes, gave them to a guard and ran in the in, in, a, in a garden stock naked. So, again this whole idea of taking out the clothes and giving them to a garden running around naked uh, becomes obviously an act of insanity, but the purposelessness of this act is also a pointer to the purposelessness of the partition in the first place. Another Muslim inmate from uh, Chinik Chinihot, an erstwhile adherent of the Muslim League who bathed 15 or 16 times a day, suddenly gave up bathing. And his name was Muhammad Ali. He one day proclaimed that he was none other than the Qadi Azam Muhammad Ali Zina. Taking a cue for him, a Sikh announced that he was Master Tara Singh, the leader of the Sikhs. This could have led to open violence, but before any harm could be done, the two lunatics were declared dangerous and locked up in a separate cell. So, again, look at the way in which this cultural consumption takes place. So, the lunatics also, some of them are also consuming this normative narrative about the Hindu India and the Muslim Pakistan, right? So, uh, uh, so, one of them, they, they claim that he is Muhammad Ali Zina uh, and obviously Muhammad Ali Zina is an iconic figure in, in Pakistan history because she was a, he, he was one of the pioneers, he was one of the uh, game makers during the partition uh, time, the partition epoch just like Nehru was for India, right. Uh, so, he, he proclaims, he claims himself to be Muhammad Ali Zina. Now, interestingly, this also produces a paradoxical effect on a Sikh who now goes on to say that I am Master Tala Singh. So, Tala Singh obviously being a Sikh leader, a Sikh guru and that becomes important. So, again look at the way in which identity formations are seemingly absurdly done, but beneath the absurdity we have a critique of the seeming rationality which had formed the partition in the first place and that is something which will keep coming up over and over again. So, I stop at this point today, we will continue with this lecture in the subsequent sessions. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.